So Emily, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. And to introduce My Emily, pleasure. Emily is the president and COO of Coinbase, uh, essentially operating Coinbase. Emily, you've taught me two things which I found so transformational that I now share them with every CEO that I coach. And I always give you credit. And those two things are decision-making through Rapids and a biz ops team. But rather than me continue to be the one translating the learnings that you gave me, I thought it'd be fun for the world to hear directly from you about Rapids and biz ops teams. What do you think about that? I love Fantastic. that. Yep. I love talking to you about this, Matt. And I think it's so timely because I get this question a lot too, all the time. And I feel like there's a way where we can package this up and make sure that people who could really use this information can get it as quickly and effectively as possible. So this is music to my ears. Awesome. Okay, great. Well, then let's start with, with Rapids because I think these are the ones yep. that people have a difficult time making decisions. Before they learn about Rapids, they need to get everybody into a room to hear everybody's opinion and then try to do it by consensus, which of course never works. And then they are never like sure who's actually deciding and how are they deciding. And Rapids take care of all those problems and make all those problems go away. So can you please explain to us what a rapid is, how it works at Coinbase, and maybe also what the pitfalls are? Because a lot of times people then start using rapids and then they get overwhelmed with like a thousand rapids get, you know, surfaced and like, which ones should we be doing? And oh my God, it's overwhelming. Not only what it is, but how to roll it out effectively. Absolutely. Okay. So let me start by saying the number one question I get from candidates that are interviewing at Coinbase is how do you do decision making? And these are people from Google, Facebook, every other tech company you can imagine. Why are they asking this? Because decision making is bureaucratic, painful, awful, wherever they work. And they want to be at an organization where there is no weird decision making, where there is no passive aggressive BS, right? And so I'm really delighted to talk to them about the way that we use Rapids. I learned about Rapids. It was a Bain construct that Jeff Weiner brought to LinkedIn and we started using them. And then I took it to Coinbase because as we scaled so dramatically, it was clear that decision making used to be so easy and became so hard. And so we needed a different construct. People used to be able to go to go in the hall to ask Brian Armstrong for a decision. As soon as we started growing exponentially, they could no longer do that. And there were no rules of the road in terms of how can I get a decision made? The basic construct of the rapid is this. There is one recommend. There is an agree, maybe a couple of agrees. There is a perform. Who is going to actually perform and implement this? There are inputs. Who are people that are going to be relevant to this that can help provide input about whatever this decision being made is? And then there is one decide. The recommend and the decide cannot be the same person. There can only be one decide. An important goal of the rapid is a decision being made. It is not about consensus. Consensus should probably never be a goal. It's a great way of creating a committee-like culture where everybody has to agree on everything. That, that should never be a goal. The person who is making the decision understands the inputs, understands the thoughts of those who have good thoughts about this recommendation, and then they can make an informed decision. We have a couple other nuances that I would just add. One is, is it a type one or a type two decision? And this is a, a Jeff Bezos construct that we've added in, which is, is it existential or is it not? If it's an existential decision, then typically it's going to have to be the CEO or the COO who's the decide. If it is a reversible decision, maybe you can push that authority down to the VP level or below and hopefully start creating some, some level of delegation in the company so folks are empowered and have some level of autonomy. An example of an existential decision would be like, are we going to enter Japan? Because once we start laying all the foundations for that, it's very hard to unwind that, right? Something that would be less existential would be something like, should we launch this feature? It's still going to be painful if we pull it back, but it's reversible if for some reason it doesn't yield the same things that we want it to. What is good about a rapid is that you have everything in writing. I can see very clearly what everybody's opinion is and if they agree or disagree with the recommendation. What that means is that in a year from now, Matt, I don't say, Matt, I thought you said this in the room. It's very clear. We can go look back at the rapid. We don't have to guess what somebody said in the room or, or remember something in a way that is not already documented. It is also good in the sense that it is out there. The recommender puts this out here and now it is up to the decide to make a decision. In fact, at Coinbase, the way that we implement it is we reward people for making decisions quickly. So if there's a rapid, for example, that lasts two weeks to make a decision, that's a failure mode. 
We want decisions to generally be made once they're documented within 48 hours, unless there's other information to be had. I think the the downfalls are problems with the rapid. It's it's a framework. Like every framework has pitfalls. I found in life that like if you kind of pick a framework and go with it, it's going to have pros and cons. But if you have have it, it's good because the company understands how to use it, when to use it, et cetera. The couple of things that we've seen that are problematic about the rapids, in general, people wanna be too polite and over include too many people on the rapid. So sometimes I'll see five agrees on the thing and I'm like, nope, cut that down to two people. You don't have to be polite. In fact, I'm giving you, I'm, I'm telling you, you must not be polite and they could maybe be an input at the most. Another and, is- And to be clear, an agree is someone who's got a veto power. So it's actually- Yes, pretty bloody correct. dangerous to have an agree. Exactly. It's, it's a very powerful role and it should be given accordingly. It's very hard in the beginning when you first launch rapids as to who should be on what part of the rapid. What I found is that the only way to do that is just start testing it out. So you ask the team who's proposing something to actually put down the different roles of the RAP ID. And then you can say like, hey, sh show me who you've got on it. And I can tell you before you even write the rapid if that feels right or not, or if oh, that definitely should have been Brian because it was above X hundred million dollar decision or wh whatever it is. And so the executive team has to be helpful in helping those teams figure out who should be on the rapid. I think there's a point at which you should just recognize rapid should be used for complex cross-functional decisions. If you're using it for generic run-of-the-mill decisions, then you're probably not operating your company the way you should, right? Because these do take time and effort. For example, product launch decisions, all that kind of stuff, those shouldn't be rapids. Those should be part of an existing fabric of how you operate the business. If these things are checked off, you can launch your feature. If you've checked off the security requirements, the compliance requirements, whatever. So you just have to make sure you use rapids judiciously so that it doesn't become this overly rapidified culture. That actually is the, the most common problem when people start to use rapids or issues proposed solutions, whichever they do. And issues proposed solutions is basically a rapid just without the agree part, without any veto power. No, I was just going to say, Matt, like you taught me the problem proposed solution thing. And I think that to me is the lightweight form of the rapid, just as you said. So when I have an issue with something that's going on in the organization and I don't want to want to do the heavyweight rapid, maybe I'll just say, I think our performance pro process is broken. I'm going to write problem. I think our performance process is broken. Proposed solutions, benchmark some of the other performance processes at companies that we admire for their performance culture, blah, 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 blah. The thing I like about the PPS is it's a 10 minute exercise, not an hour long exercise. Right on. But part of the beauty of like a PPS or a rapid is you do want to empower people lower in the org to be able to flag things that they think are big deals. Like you don't want a completely hierarchical culture where a political manager, for example, would be like, no, I don't want you to raise that because it'll make me look bad or anything like that. A tone from the top is if you have a really important thing that you want to raise through a PPS that you think we could be doing better as a company, you go for it. Like we, we want to see that and you can lob it into the CEO if you need to. Fantastic. I love it. But either way, both have usually Google Docs with a call out for, you know, at mention all the people that you want to comment on it. And what I found in other companies when they've started using this that have, you know, several hundred employees or more, all of a sudden junior level people all of a sudden realize, oh my gosh, I have the power to write one of these. Now they just go yes. and all of a sudden you get hundreds of right. written, you know, rapids or PPSs, whatever you want to, whichever format. Is everyone supposed to respond to all of them? Do they have to respond to all of them? There's no way to prioritize or to filter. And so having a filtration process is actually key before rolling them out. And so what is the filtration process that Coinbase uses? This is the role of managers, right? And and frankly, at the beginning, it's going to be the executive team and the VP level folks who can kind of weed through these. You have a system where managers can say, hey, listen, love that you were so enthusiastic about the rapid. This is probably not suited for a rapid. Maybe you just had a product idea that you wanted to lob into the product team. There's probably a better way to do that. And that's where the human interaction layer of this has to take place. And then you set the culture and people understand it and they help each other. And then they kind of learn what's, what's appropriate for a rapid or not. Perfect. So every time sounds like whenever someone creates a rapid in Coinbase, they vet it through their manager who helps them decide whether or not it's worth pu pushing out and how it should be pushed out up until the CEO, Brian, can always yeah, as the Apex manager can always say, hey, we're not dealing with this. Probably also assigns the decision maker because that's another thing that I found is that people, you talk about type one and type two, people would propose a decision maker, but they're just taking a guess. They don't know really who it should be. And there should be some authority who says, actually, the decision is going to be that person over there. And you already talked about how that's right. if it's type two, it shouldn't be Brian or you. And frankly, probably there are very few type one decisions. 
you mentioned going to Japan. There are very few type one decisions, but sometimes when you're scaling, these crazy existential questions come up. And so it's good to make sure there's alignment at the executive level. That's another thing that's nice. If you can make your rapids transparent to some of the senior leaders in the company and kind of go through them with them, it's really nice for them to be able to see how we do make decisions because then they can emulate that that thinking. What you said earlier was around context. You take these rapids and then once a decision is made, you make them available to some group of people, hopefully the wider the better, yep. because then not only do they know what the decision is, but they know why it got created. And a lot of times yes. if people hear a decision, but they don't know why it got created, they're like, that was stupid, or I don't buy into that, or what's going on? And they dismiss it or aren't enthusiastic about it. Whereas if you share with them why, they go, oh, now I get it. It's sort of like in the military, yes. giving an order with context, instead of just going, take that hill, take that hill because we need to control the transport, you know, the, the highway underneath it. Well, if you can't take the hill, maybe there's some other way to control the highway underneath it. And so if they know the why, exactly. they can actually better implement the decision that's being made. And that's the only way you scale. If you expect people to just to be able to deduce things from the final decision, as opposed to the context, they're, they're not going to learn. Agreed. I love it, Emily. Thank you very much. That was fantastic. Now let's yeah. shift gears for a second. Let's talk about the other thing that I, that I learned from you. I learned many things, but these are two, two highlights is a BizOps team. And let me describe to you what I'm sharing with others of what the BizOps team is and what the role is, and then let's have you alter it to what it really is. What I noticed was, Emily, that you had a team of folks at Coinbase who were primarily ex-consultants, McKinsey, BCG, Bain types. They were just very good communicators, highly organized, smart, problem solvers, project manager types. They weren't technical in any sense. They weren't engineers, they weren't lawyers, they didn't have any technical knowledge. They were just really good problem solvers. And what would happen is whenever there was a problem going on at Coinbase, we'd say, what's, what's, I don't understand, what's going on? Why is this not working? You would send one of these people in to go investigate and they would come back with why it was happening and what the solution was to fix it. Then I think you took another radical step at Coinbase. I don't think you'd done this before Coinbase, but at Coinbase, you then said, if the issue was, well, there's a, just a department that just isn't succeeding, like the department head is just not a good manager. You then took one of these BizOps folks, launched them into that department, and had them actually run the department. Now, this was a scary moment when you did it for the first time, because that's not how you'd used the role before. But I'd love to hear how it turned out and do you continue to use BizOps in that way? So that's my understanding of, of what BizOps is. Now, what is it really? That's it in a nutshell. So you put it beautifully, Matt, to think about what issue founders are really struggling with now. They keep asking me, do I need a COO? One of the first things I would do before you like just jump to the conclusion of needing a heavyweight COO is to say, do I have a great BizOps team? I think of BizOps as exactly the same way you do, Matt, which is a special forces brigade or whatever. They're generalist athletes. They're super smart. They know how to problem solve. They're excellent communicators and they can just get shit done. Examples of this may be we need to benchmark world-class compliance organizations in fintech and financial services and figure out what we want for Coinbase and how we build that here. It might be that we are not data-driven enough in recruiting and we don't understand where the gaps are in our recruiting process. We understand that the top of the funnel and the bottom of the funnel, but we don't understand anything in between. We can deploy that team to go find out all of that data, create a great process and fix everything. And it can be strategic too. It can be, how do we create a great business planning process for the company? All of this is to say, how do we, we enable things to ship as quickly as possible and as effectively as possible, such that the founder who is likely probably product and engineering minded can do what they do best and that there's a team or person supplementing them by saying like, I'm going to make your life as frictionless as possible. That's how I think of BizOps. I'm very proud of, of what we built at Coinbase. I think, you know, I learned this at LinkedIn. Google famously also had a great BizOps team. And whenever you work with these people, they're just a different level. Like Balaji Srinivasan, whom we worked with at, at Coinbase, as you know, Matt, he's not one to, you know, dole out compliments. And as he was leaving Coinbase, one of the things he said is like, the thing I learned from you, Emily, is like, these consultants are actually pretty darn good. And they, they add a ton of value. That's like the ultimate compliment to the BizOps team in terms of the value they added. One of the other cool things about BizOps that I would say is that over time, what you'll find is there's two different career paths for them. 
One is maybe they want to be a biz ops lifer. That's awesome because we'll, we can, we'll take them for all day long. The other is that because they then parachute into these other problems at the company, people see them, they want to work with them because they're superstars. And so you see this incredible internal mobility. And that was actually a, a measure of success that we measured at LinkedIn, which was that the biz ops team disproportionately was kind of sought after and recruited within the company. And that, that was a measure of success. It was like, oh yeah, like they're doing their tours of duty because they're crushing it. And, and we want them to move on to more and more other roles. And then over time, they can rise up to be leaders in the organization. Yeah. And, and I'm going to go for a specific example here because I think it's important for the world to hear this. As I recall it, there was a point where the people department wasn't functioning the way it needed to. You were sort of at a loss. You know, you, it's going to take six months to hire a chief people officer at least and get the person in the seat. Like, what do you do in the interim? And you went with a decision. I think it was Grant. You just put him in charge of people. No one knew how it was going to work. How did it turn out? Grant is now head of recruiting. And I want to just, I want to make sure we we say this the right way. The people organization wasn't scaling to the needs of thousands of employees. Right. I think that the way that it had been run historically was like, it was a startup and the way that it was run was a startup. And now we needed to kind of take it to the next level in terms of data and, and making sure that we're doing the best job we can for a world where we have to hire thousands of employees, manage thousands of employees. What are those practices that we need to implement? What are those people? that we need to hire for that. Grant, who is an amazing, he was my head of biz ops. He's a superstar, super fun to work with. He's like, okay, like I, I would love to help that team. So what does he do? He parachutes in, he takes over the recruiting function and he ended up loving it so much that he, he came to me one day and he was like, Emily, I'm sorry, I love biz ops, but I really love recruiting. And now he's in this incredible role running recruiting where he is responsible for hiring thousands of people. Talent is our number one operating priority there. It will never change. And so you have this incredible person at the helm of that, like fueling it with energy and athleticism and just taking it to the next level. Awesome. I mean, that, that's the key point there is that these biz ops folks are able to actually run whole departments very successfully. Yep. Right. I love it. Fantastic. But I ask you one more question. There's another thing that, that's unique at Coinbase. And that is Brian recognized that he didn't love internal operations. He didn't love uh, accountability and one-on-ones and running team meetings and having everyone prepare for them. And what he really loves is product vision, which frankly, most founders that I work with, that's actually what they love. And I think he also finally recognized that if he doesn't love something, he's not going to be great at it. Even though he sort of for a long time felt that the CEO must be doing the one-on-ones and the team running the team meetings, etc. He finally gave in to like, well, I'm probably not good at it. And I can see over there, there's Emily and she's awesome at it. Why don't I just let her do it? And he finally put you in that role of literally running the internal operations of the company, which is the company, while he is still heavily involved in product, heavily involved in the messaging to the world. But the day-to-day -day of one-on-ones and team meetings and coordinating the company is you. And in my opinion, that's when Coinbase took a hockey stick and started to soar to the moon. Is that what happened? Thank you so much for saying that, Matt. The combination of Brian and I unlocks value because we are very complementary to one another in terms of our skill sets and what we actually enjoy doing. He's amazing at seeing what the next frontier of crypto and technology is. What I am good at is, and this, by the way, this is why I was in Corp Dev. I love being around founders because I am not the creative type. I like to be around that energy because I'm super inspired by these risk takers and these people who have these bonkers ideas. And what I can do is I often hear him say something, I'll digest it and I'll be like, wait, that was crazy. Why did he say that? And then I'll be like, actually, that wasn't so crazy. And how can I help him operationalize that? So an example is before COVID, Brian was like, we got to go to a remote first world. Coinbase needs to go into the cloud. That's the way the world's going to go. And you know, me in my very kind of centralized headquarter kind of mindset was like, that's not going to work. That doesn't work. I know that doesn't work. But I thought about it. And then during COVID, we were just like, this is so obvious now. I can't believe it wasn't obvious before. And so we just went all in on remote. I helped him operationalize that. So he comes up with these amazing ideas. I digest and I help operationalize. And I think that's the winning combo. The winning combo is also trust. And I, I credit you, Matt, for helping us build that trust with one another and kind of ripping off that band-aid. And that's why I think when you are hiring like a COO type, it's almost better that you hire somebody who's like going to be running a smaller function within the company. See how you gel with them and see if you want to give them the chance to kind of, you know, rise up to that role over time, totally as opposed to trying to put in some cold turkey process person from the outside and, and hoping that everything just magically, that chemistry starts manifesting. It's 
super high beta. That's how we work together. And honestly, it's magic now because we understand each other's swim lanes. He appreciates the stuff I do on the operational side. He might not want to be in the details of it, but he appreciates a good OKR. He appreciates the good stuff that comes out of that. And in, in turn, I love all the ideas he comes up with. And that's the energy that I get. And that, that to me is the magic of what you can get with two different types. Fantastic. I love it. Emily, yeah. that works fantastic. This is going to benefit a lot of people. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me, Matt. Awesome. And thank Emily. you.